Welcome back to the channel. There's been quite a number of dangerous misunderstandings about the law surrounding carrying a knife out in public. That is carrying a knife that people think is legal and an exception. Now there is an exception for carrying a small knife and I'm going to explain that again in this video. I've done it many times before but just to ensure that people don't get caught out by these misunderstandings. Now the videos that I've watched on TikTok are showing lots of concealed knives and things that are being described as a self-defense knife. Now, just to be clear, there is no such thing as a self-defense knife that is somehow permitted and legal. I'm going to explain, broadly speaking, the law around carrying a knife around in the UK. And my bottom line position is that you shouldn't. Now, lots of people will say that it should be perfectly fine for you to carry something around. There are certain situations when that could be okay, and I'll cover off some of those as well. But starting with the most dangerous misunderstanding that's been put around on TikTok is that if you're carrying something that is under three inches, then automatically it's okay. Now, this is a misunderstanding that has come about because there is an exemption under Section 139 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988, which is for a folding pocket knife, which does not exceed three inches and is immediately foldable at all times. Now, this must be a folding pocket knife with a blade that doesn't exceed three inches. But there are also lots of other things to consider when you're carrying this around. First and foremost, if you are carrying this around for the purposes of self-defense and you are stopped with it and asked why you have it with you and you say that it is for self-defense, that automatically makes this an offensive weapon. And there is a number of offenses you, with which you could be charged, which include being in possession of a pointed and bladed article in the public place, regardless of it being uh, within the exemption of a folding pocket knife. Um, in possession of an offensive weapon and worse still if you end up using this in self-defense then you've used an offensive weapon and if you do injure somebody else with it either by just threatening them and you've caused uh, injury in a sense in a psychological sense that they fear immediate harm or worse still you actually cause them physical injury that is wounding and it be it will be wounding with intent and so on and so forth so there are lots and lots of offenses that can uh, extend on just from what you think is being in possession of something that you think is a legal item now the law provides this exception for a folding pocket knife for one simple reason and that simple reason only in that it is a tool of sorts for some situations so if you are carrying a folding pocket knife and your intent is to use it for certain limited uses that a tool of that nature could be used for that is really all that the law is intended that for now the dangerous misunderstanding comes that people think that because it's under three inches it's perfectly legal to carry i've seen lots of these videos and lots of people seem to believe and lots of people watch it and they like the comments like and comment and they believe that these are legal because they're under three inches that's obviously not true it must come within the exemption by being a folding pocket knife and therefore it must not lock, it cannot have jagged edges, it, it can't be concealed, it can't be flicking out or locking in any, any kind of way, it can't be spring-loaded and all sorts of other things. And certainly if it's one of these concealed items, that is going to be outright banned regardless of how long it is. So even those that are really tiny, uh, that come out of a, a hidden area, or spring-loaded or whatever they are banned and you will be in trouble for carrying those around now for any other situation when you think that you might need to have a knife with you the most obvious being fishing and camping and things of that nature or even climbing so that you may want to have a knife with you so that if you get into trouble you can cut the rope so let's say that you don't choke yourself or something like that then you have to have a good reason and a good reason is something that's been debated and ruled upon many times in court so forgetting that you have a knife with you is not a good reason if you've just bought them from a shop you've got the receipt they're still in the box and they're in the boot of the car and you're on the way home that's a good reason to have knives with you because you're on the way home if you're a chef on the way to or from work that would be a good reason whereas if you've just forgotten about them and they're in the boot and you go out somewhere else that's not a good reason because forgetting that you have them with you is not a good reason workmen and women that have all sorts of different knives and tools with them most notably one that came out in videos just recently somebody said and, and i quote 
I carry a Stanley with me because it's under three inches, therefore it's legal. Now a Stanley knife, for anyone that isn't aware of it, is a tiny blade, razor blade, which is locking in a handheld unit. And there are obviously various other manufacturers that do exactly that. These are not going to be legal to carry unless you have a good reason. And the good reason is going to be very restrictive and it's going to be something along the lines of you need it for work, you're going to and from work. If you've left it in your pocket after work and you end up in the pub and you've got it in your pocket, that's not a good reason. Having been to work earlier on is not a good reason. So you need to ensure that you're not carrying these things with you. So I just wanted to make this short video to clear up this misunderstanding that you might see these videos popping around telling you that these things are legal, even selling them to you and you're buying them. And even if something is, uh, which I'm going to come on to now, is, is not necessarily a typical knife of sorts. It's just some kind of pointed object. But if it's designed to cause harm, then it can still come within the definition of an offensive weapon. Because an offensive weapon is broadly in three different categories. Firstly, the easiest one to identify is that which is something that has been made for the purposes of causing harm. The second is something that's been adapted so that it causes harm. The easiest example is a broken bottle. A bottle by itself is obviously not designed to cause harm, but if you break it specifically for the purposes of causing a jagged edge so that you can use it to injure somebody, then it's been adapted for the purposes of causing harm. The third one is the one that catches a lot of people out because if you carry something with the intent of causing harm, even if that in your mind is in a self-defense scenario, if the intent is to cause harm, then you're carrying it with the intent to cause harm, ergo it's an offensive weapon. Now quite easily you can understand that this makes virtually anything capable of being an offensive weapon. You could carry a blunt object, you could carry a heavy object, you could just carry something that is long with any kind of edge to it and you could make that uh, an offensive weapon just with the intention with which you are carrying this item. Now people ask then about self-defense and how does this work with self-defense? Well you will still be able to run your argument of self-defense in the event that you are attacked and then you respond using, for example, said item in your possession, but you're going to have to overcome the difficulty that is that you will be carrying an offensive weapon, even if it's not designed as such. If you're carrying it with the purposes of using it to cause harm, you are carrying an offensive weapon. Therefore, if you then execute some self-defense with a weapon, the very big question that comes up, not just about the carrying of the weapon uh, in and of itself, but in executing your self-defense, there is a two-part test. Firstly, subjectively, what you genuinely believe the circumstances to be and whether you think the use of force is necessary in that situation. If you end up in a Crown Court, the jury is going to be asked to consider whether they really believe that you genuinely believed that those were the circumstances and that you believed the use of force was necessary. But the second part to that test is where you might struggle if you're carrying any kind of weapon and you use any kind of weapon. That is, whether that force used was reasonable. Now clearly, if somebody punches you but then you use any kind of weapon, it's going to be much more difficult to, for you to convince a jury that the use of force in your situation was reasonable. Of course, you may well get a jury decide in your favour and just believe that you had the right to defend yourself, but these are matters left to a jury ordinarily and this, this is not something you want to leave to chance. So if you end up harming the other person very much more significantly than they harmed you in the first place, you'll just bear in mind you're have, going to have to overcome that burden when it gets to a Crown Court with the uh, question over whether it was reasonable force used in that situation. Finally, lots of people ask the question about using something at home and whether you can keep something at home for the purposes of self-defense. Now, in the strictest sense, you're going to have the same kind of problems to overcome, although Cases at home, such as burglaries, are known as householder cases, which removes the proportionality test and replaces it with a test which is grossly disproportionate to the force used against you. So, in other words, what this means is you could use force that is more than is reasonable force, and it's still okay because it's a householder case. Whereas if you used grossly disproportionate force against that intruder, 
then you may still be liable for the injuries and the damage that you've caused to that person. The obvious example is if somebody breaks in and let's say you punch them and hit them and they fall unconscious to the ground. If you repeatedly hit them and kick them or bash them with other kinds of weapons and they sustain life changing injuries, for example, that would be grossly disproportionate force of self-defense and thus your self-defense is likely to fail. Of course, there is always the situation where you might get a jury that just takes your side and believes that you had the right to defend your home and the jury acquits you even if the judge directs them to return a guilty verdict because what you've said doesn't amount to a defence in law. For example, you may still get a jury that uh, decides to override that because ultimately the jury's verdict is the jury's verdict. They will choose what they decide. So I hope that's a useful overview. Please don't get taken in by these videos on social media that are telling you this, that or the other are legal to carry because of whatever reason they're under three inches. Most of those that I've seen are blatantly wrong and blatantly misleading and frankly dangerous information for you to take to believe that that is true. So I hope that has been useful and enlightening for you. Please do remember to smash that like button and subscribe. I really enjoy bringing these videos to you so please help me reach a wider audience so I can help more people understand law. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.